Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer all of your questions tonight. That is why we're here, after all. Uh, so, welcome to Water Talk. I'm Seth Wallach. I'm the Water Authority Community Outreach Coordinator. Uh, next slide. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why uh, we, we do this program. Uh, so, we know there's a lot of information about drinking water quality. It's something that's always in the news. So, we want to make sure everyone has the most accurate information and everyone has the opportunity to ask us whatever they need to ask us. A few years ago, we started this program uh, that we hold throughout our entire service territory. That's Melville and Montauk, the entire county. And you're going to hear from the experts to my left uh, about vital topics to the section and preservation of your drinking water supply, specifically your water quality tonight. Uh, and for instance, you're going to hear from uh, Chris Siebling about the steps our laboratory takes to make sure your drinking water is always safe. We're also going to talk to you a little bit about the infrastructure in the Belfort area. And we're going to talk to you about a program we developed called Water Track that actually allows you to monitor water quality from home. We'll tell you how to use that website a little later in the program. And like I said, most importantly, we're here to answer anything you need. So just really quick before I hand it over uh, to start the program, I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are. The Suffolk County Water Authority is a independent public benefit corporation operating under the public authorities law of New York State. And what that means is we serve approximately 1.2 million people throughout Suffolk County. We began our operations in 1951, and we operate without taxing power on a not-for-profit basis. We are the largest uh, supplier of solely groundwater in the country. So who are we not? Uh, we're actually not a branch of Suffolk County government. Uh, a lot of people are confused by that, just because of our name, obviously. And we don't create or enforce drinking water regulations. This is the job of the US EPA and the New York State Department of Health. And then I just wanted to tell you about a new program uh, we launched recently called Water Test. So upon request, SDWA will sample and test the water at your tap, which is a request we've always honored, but we're really rolling out a bigger program uh, to see if more people want to take advantage of this. And so if you do, please contact SDWA customer service. That phone number is 631-698-9500. And customer service over the phone will schedule an appointment with you for a sample collector to come out, collect that sample, and we'll contact you with the results of your water test. This phone number will be on the screen a couple of times tonight. So if you need it, I have my card with me. Don't worry, you don't catch it right now. And this service, of course, is free of charge whether or not uh, you're an SPWA account holder so long as you live within Suffolk County. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, our laboratory manager. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Niebling. I'm a laboratory manager at the Water Authority. A little bit about myself. I've been with this company now for 27 years, uh, all of which have been in the lab. Um, I started as a chemist. Uh, I had the opportunities to work in pretty much every department uh, throughout the laboratory, and I've been the lab manager <coughs> now for the past seven years. Um, just a little side note. Um, I grew up in this neighborhood, uh, specifically in Patrick, uh, trying to live in Belport, uh, right off of Head Neck Road, so I'm about five minutes away, so I'm a local here, so you guys know. Um, enough about me, a little bit about the laboratory. Um, a lot of people aren't aware that we have one of the largest, most advanced groundwater laboratories in the country. Uh, hands down, we're very proud of that fact. Um, we have about 51 employees, from chemists and lab technicians to microbiologists to IT and support staff uh, working in the laboratory. Um, of our 585 wells located all throughout Suffolk County, um, we take samples uh, as we call the wellhead. That is the actual raw water that comes out of the ground. Okay. We also take a various stages of treatment. If there is some sort of filtration system at a well field, we'll take a before, a before sample and an after sample at that well field. Um, we also test the treated water. And what I mean by treated uh, is that we add chlorine to disinfect. We don't want to have a bacteria issues uh, in our distribution system. And we add hydrated lime to adjust the pH. And the reason for this uh, is our groundwater is naturally acidic. Okay? 
We want to get the pH up to school seven is about eight in that range. Uh, and that's basically for corrosion control purposes. Um, you guys probably heard of Flint, in Michigan. Uh, a simple pH test would have probably solved a lot of those issues there, uh, where that aggressive water was actually leaching the heavy metals coming off the water. Main. That's something you don't want to have. So that's why we have the line to adjust the pH. Um, we test for, um, like I said, the bacteria and also a wide range of inorganic and organic chemicals. Um, some of the inorganics are your uh, metals, um, your anions, your nitrates, things of that nature. Uh, the organic chemicals are uh, pesticides, herbicides, uh, what we call VOCs or volatile organic contaminants. Those are the greasy solvents, dry cleaning solvents, gasoline derivatives. Um, you name it, we're testing for it. Um, just some numbers here. Um, this is from our 2020, which is our public, our current uh, public data. Uh, we did 95,328 samples in 2020, which is kind of around 203,000 tests. Okay, we looked for 414 compounds, which is 265 more than what is required by our regulators. Mr. Hines can account for that. Um, and we tested a higher frequency. Um, every January or February, the department will send us a list of the minimum sampling requirements. Um, if we feel we need to go to a well field and test on a weekly basis, we will, we go monthly, we go quarterly. Uh, you know, at minimum twice a year, we're going to go to the well field, as well as our sample stations. We have a picture that's uh, set up in the up and coming slides. Um, if you want to take the, uh, I'll answer this one, but let's see the question. We have uh, 238 uh, well fields, 585 active wells, and about low 600s. Some of the wells are still out of service. The 585. Okay. Um, and then the last uh, bullet here is our in house standards are, are often uh, tougher than what is required of us from our regulators. So basically, this is an example. Um, of those 585 wells, we have about 161 wells that are on filter. Okay. Now, picture your little Brita filter, but on a huge scale. Okay. Over time, these filters become what we call saturated and start to see breakthroughs um, of some of the contaminants. So, just to give an example, say if you have an MCL of five, we'll change that carbon out of two. Okay. But by law, we can go up to 4.99 and still be. Okay, within regulation. So our standards in house are much stricter uh, than what is required of it. So this, um, this particular slide here, I always like to go over levels of detection. This is kind of put into perspective. Okay, when I first started 27 years ago, okay, the instrumentation wasn't essential. Okay, we were mainly looking at uh, parts per million or milligrams per year. We had a few methods in the 80s. Uh, when it starts with the micrograms per liter, but nanograms per liter, which is part of the trillion, is only recent. Okay, and the reason for that is that the instrumentation back then wasn't as sensitive. Um, put this in perspective uh, one part per million or milligram per liter is one second in 12 days. Okay, one part per billion or microgram per liter is one second in 32 years. And then look at this one here. Part per trillion is one second in 32,000 years. Okay, really tiny amount. You have to always take that into perspective when you're looking at the you know, first of all. Okay, like I mentioned, um, these are sample stations that we have located throughout the distribution system. Uh, we have about 350 of these. These are kind of in your backyard, Johnny Street, they're in. Um, some commercial areas, we, we tend to, you know, put these in there like school, you know, school districts uh, in areas spread out throughout the distribution system. And we pick these, our technicians pick these every single day. Um, we're mainly looking for um, microbiology and bacteriology um, samples here. And we do about 950 a month, okay? We also, twice a year, we'll go to these sites and we can see sex. And that's basically going back to testing all 414 compounds that I mentioned earlier. Because you want to see what's going on, you know, besides at the well field, but in the distribution system, you know, with our water main. Is there one of the one of those uh, testing systems 
in the community here? Yeah, I'm going to explain. I got a couple of slides coming up. I'm going to explain you know, exactly so tell you where they are too. Um, this next slide here, uh, our consumer confidence report. We're required once a year to basically put out all of our drinking water data. Okay, this is currently on our website. Uh, and what this report is, this is the treated water. This is the water that is going out to the customer. Okay, there's a lot of information on here. It's about 52 pages long. Um, it takes you about three good months to put this thing together, reviewing all the data, making sure everything's right, making sure the language is right from our health department. Uh, and once that's done, okay, we do send it off to the health department for approval. Once it's done, we then post it on our website. Okay, if you go to our website here at SWA.com, you're going to click on drinking uh, water reports. Okay, it's going to bring you to the page, and there's a link there. Okay, that has five years worth of data on it. Okay, so we'd like to keep at least five uh, years of data. You click on that link, it's going to bring you to another page, and there's two options there. The first option you click on, the first link, it's going to bring up the whole report. You can scroll through it. Okay, it's 53 pages long, you can print it out, you know, read it up to read it. The other link, which I like, is an interactive map. You can type in your address. Okay, and enter, and it's going to basically zoom right into your house. And it's going to actually give you the water quality data for your area. In the district? Yes. Can yes. you explain to everybody what District 1 encompasses? Yes. District 1 is the big uh, district. So basically, when you're reading this report, you're going to see a, a low, a high, and an average. You kind of want to look at the average because, like you mentioned, our distribution system, which is uh, zone 1, goes from East Farmingdale, now all the way out to Flanders. It used to stop at the Common River um, just before Massac and Shirley. Now it encompasses a large region. Okay, so zone one is pretty big. So when you read that, okay, you're going to want to look at the average result on that report. So it's a little misleading to say that we're zoning for our house, right? We're going from Flanders to East Farmingdale and seeing the water district as a whole. You see the high, the low, um, but it's not well, yeah, it's not it's not completely primary focus, you know, you know, right at your house. The data that I'm going to show you now moving forward, this is focused. Is that online? No, this is part of that data that I review that goes into the you know drinking water report. But I just wanted for today's purposes, I wanted to bring up the water quality in, in this area here. Like I mentioned, I live in this area, in this in this area. So I'm pretty familiar with the wells here, as all the wells in Suffolk County. Um, so what I did was I ran a query from January 1st to the present, okay, for Station Road Wellfield, which is pretty much right around the corner, head of the neck, which is a couple blocks down that way. Like I said, I live off the head of the neck. And we have two sample stations. One is right behind the Station Road Wellfield at Sundial uh, Road, and the other one is on Fireplace Neck Road um, in Brookhaven Hamlet near the elementary school. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit of this data. Um, what I ran, okay, besides the naturally occurring um, elements like the calcium, magnesium, potassium, um, therapy, chlorine residual, nothing else really stands out besides um, these couple of uh, compounds here. Now, really, the first one, because I know there's been a lot of talk about the iron and manganese in this area, so I wanted to highlight the iron here at Station Road. Um, it's really a non issue. The average value. Uh, is about 33, and as you can see, the MCL is, is 300. That MCL is what we call a secondary MCL, okay? It's not a health effect MCL, it's more or less for aesthetics. So we try to keep that number under 300. Once you start to get over that, you start to get those rest of the water complaints, okay, which we try to avoid. Okay, the actual MCL for iron is, is 1,000 or one part per million. Okay, so as you can see, 33 was pretty low here. Um, manganese, okay. This one here, um, we did have a spike back in, in February, and I think what happened was is that one of the wells was out of service for about four months. Okay, so we fired it back up. Maybe there was a little spike there, but the trend currently is going back down to almost, you know, where it has been. And as you can see, the average value about 107. Okay, so we're pretty much, you know, not even at half the MCL in terms of magnets at that well field. Um, 
the last two here, the PFO and PFOS, um, a little bit more detail on these. These are emerging towns. Okay. Back in 2013, EPA put out um, one of their UCMR um, rules, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. And what this is, is that EPA looks at potentially between 20 and 30 uh, compounds that they think could impact drinking water. Okay. Part of this uh, study was, uh, you know, the PFOS, uh, PFOS, the perfluorinated outfield compounds. And so what EPA requires is that drinking water supplies set up the methods, okay, to get everything validated, and then we start to sample, okay? Back in 2013, okay, when we started sampling for these, the methodology was, was, was pretty, you know, not archaic, but it wasn't as sensitive as it is today, okay? To give you an example, the reporting limits were for P4 were 20 parts per trillion, and P5 was up at 40. Okay, so the instrumentation, I guess, and you know, and the methodology wasn't as great back in 2013. To give you an example, there were only a handful of laboratories back then that were actually certified to test it. There was really only a handful of real ones. Okay, we first started testing. Okay, the wells are negative at Station Road. Okay, we continue to test like we do in most of these DCMR methods, and then over time, okay, in late 2018, we got a hit above the 40. It was around 62 in that range. So what we immediately did is we started to blend with the other wells. Okay, we are allowed to blend. If there's a well that's negative and there's a well that's positive, we blend that well. And we did that for a few months, okay, until we're able to install a DA system. Okay, at that particular well field. At that time, we continued to test. Okay, and we were also developing an in house method, which we got approval in mid 2019 with much lower reporting on the phone institutions, down to two parts per trillion of PFOS and PFOS. And the state, you know, gave us accreditation for that. And we've been testing all of our wells ever since with this method. It's much more sensitive. The instrumentation has gotten better over time. Okay. Now, that particular GAC came in in March of 2020, okay, well before the MCL of 10 in August of 2020. So we were trying to be very proactive with this and stay ahead of the curve, okay, and that's basically what we did here. Uh, with respect to the manganese, uh, CEO Cornoy, when he met with us a few months ago, two and a half months ago, uh, said that based on his research, the source of the brown water in North Belport was elevated manganese levels at the station road well. But here you are showing me that it's not a problem. So uh, it's the data. I know. So I'm, I would like Mr. Cornell to kind of explain what was his research that led him to that statement, public statement in a community meeting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, can we say, just take the questions at the end? It'll be a little bit easier. All right, so I just I just wanted you to bring this up. So you know, if you're looking here on average, okay, you know, you got four seconds and thirty two thousand years. Okay, we've been kind of swimming around in these fluorinated compounds for a long time. Microwave popcorn days. We've all been to Burger King. We've got you know these fast food wrappers, pizza boxes, Scotch guard on your you know your rugs, on your couches, you know your waterproofing on your jacket. Okay. With that being said, you know, other sources of people on the bus or um, firefighting phones. Sometimes if you have a tire fire or you know, something like that, fire department are using firefighting phones, uh, industrial stills, um, things of that nature. Mantle. Mantles are definitely, you know, of course, um, it's actually floating in our kids' yard. We're aware. Yeah. All right. Next slide. Um, head of the neck road. Okay. Um, manganese is not an issue, okay? Iron is an issue. And the reason for this, a lot of our south shore wells are deep. You know, these wells are about 500, like about 500 feet deep. Okay, they're just, and, and with the, the acidity of the water, a little bit of chemistry and the lack of oxygen, you're going to get a little bit of iron on the south shore. Okay, once again, on average, we're about 235, which is below that um, secondary standard of 300. We do have a couple, you know, hits of, you know, 400, maybe the ball starts up, that sort of thing. Okay, but that's the data 
were kind of in that growth. No other issues there um, as far as other concerns. And then lastly here, um, these are the two sample stations that I had, uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the one is on Sundial Road, which is basically I like the reference out, probably as far forward right behind me. And then the other one is the fireplace neck road, um, is located in Hamlet. Um, similar to your wells, okay, you know, you have a little bit of spike of iron here at 200, on average 79. Uh, the manganese is really a non issue. Um, and you do, uh, because that one is, is close from time to time, you will get some hits of the people and the two bots, you know, as you see there at the four and three points. So that's really um, the water quality um, in this area. Okay. And I, at that point, I'll show it to uh, Joe Capone. Do you do questions at the end or at the end? Okay. Thanks a lot, Chris. Well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Joe Capone. I'm the Deputy CEO for Operations at the Water Authority. Um, like Chris, I've been at the Water Authority for 26 to 27 years. Uh, I've uh, worked in a couple of different departments at the Water Authority before I came to the position that I'm in now. And, uh, you know, water is something that's very near and dear to my heart. So at the end, when you have questions, we'd be more than happy to ask. So the, uh, the Suffolk County Water Authority water system is a very large water system. It's one of the largest water systems. Uh, it consists of, as we said before, it's uh, 585 wells, uh, uh, 240 pump stations. The, the numbers change, believe it or not, because we take wells in and out of service all the time. Just over the winter, we'll take wells out of service. Just because water demand drops precipitously uh, over the winter, so we have the option to take wells out of service so that we don't have to run them. Also, wells need maintenance all the time, so pump fails. The wells themselves fail, they have to be replaced on a regular basis. So we're constantly working on that infrastructure. And I know everybody's heard about infrastructure, we're all talking about infrastructure these days. It's a very capital intensive business to work with. So keeping everything running and up to date is a very, very uh, labor and uh, dollar wise expensive proposition. Uh, so, in addition to the wells themselves, we have a mechanism for storing water, right? Just these are the tanks that you see. And we have a variety of different tanks. Uh, we have 68 storage tanks. Some of them are elevated. Some of them sit on top of a hill that are on the ground. Some of them are below ground. So it's a variety of them. It all depends on the hydraulic physics system. And as you know, Long Island varies from places that are close to the shore like this. And then we have places that uh, when you get to the center of the island that are almost 400 feet above sea level. So that creates a hydraulic challenge for the system. And so that's why the tanks are the system type. Uh, our average daily pumpage, uh, so this would be taking the entire year, the average every day pumpage uh, is about 210 million gallons. But on a peak day, and it's an average peak day, which means if we take all of our peak days and we add them up on average, we pump over twice that much. Water. So it's 470 million gallons. And then uh, the things that you see most as evidence of the water system are our uh, fire hydrants. So we have 37,000 fire hydrants. And those fire hydrants all have to be ready to go anytime there's an emergency, right? We don't know when an emergency is going to take place. But firefighters need to know that when they show up to a fire hydrant and open it, they're going to get sufficient uh, water so that they can fight a fire, uh, you know, car fire, house fire, whatever it is in your area. And we're very proud of the fact that we do a lot of work to maintain those fire hydrants. If a car hits a fire hydrant in the middle of the night, we go out there, we make sure that it's not leaking. So we will we commit to typically having a hydrant back in service within 24 hours. Uh, I don't think there's another water just on the line that has that type of service. But we take uh, first responders and public safety very, very seriously. So this is a slide that gives you an idea of uh, where all those uh, 585 or so wells are located. And as you can see, they're pretty much distributed out throughout the entire county. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and that's because we can't take water from one end of the county and ship it all the way to the other end of the county. The transmission network is simply not capable of doing that. Most of our pipes, the largest pipes that we have in our system are 16 inches so, uh, and most of them are down around 10 and 12 inches. And just from friction losses, you can't push water more than a few miles through pipes without losing an awful lot of uh, uh, pressure to the pipe. 
So what you, instead you have is you have a very gridded network with well fields that are distributed throughout the entire uh, county. If you look, you'll see some areas on the map here where there's some vacant spots here, like this here, this is the town of Riverhead. They've got their own water district, so we don't serve that area. And then over in Huntington, there are three water districts, the Green Lawn Water District, the South Huntington Water District, and the Dixville Water District. Those are town run districts, and they run their own districts. So we don't serve that area too. Same goes for Hampton Bays. Uh, and so these areas compromise about, uh, comprise about 16% of the rest of the water public. So the water authority serves about 85% of Suffolk County's population. Now, in order to serve these people all adequately in a very, very large service area, we have to have facilities that are spread out. So we've gone through this over many years. We've opened and closed facilities. But right now, the way we have it set up is we have all the way in the west, we have an office in Huntington. We have offices down in Great in um, um, Oakdale and in Bayshore. And in the center of the island, Chris's laboratory is in uh, Hop Hog. We have a central operating facility up in Orm. We have a spot in West Hampton and our furthest east operations center is in East Hampton. And in all these facilities, we have crews that come there every day. This is where they work out of. And that gives us the ability by having them laid out in that fashion to be able to respond to emergencies. Quickly, uh, and also to efficiently do the work. We would never send a crew you know, from Huntington to Montauk to do work. So we want to be able to have people get to work in the morning and, and within a short period of time get to the location where they work. So with respect to the infrastructure, so I was talking about piping and infrastructure and why not. This is a map of the Belport area here. And this gives you an idea of what this gridded network looks like, all these pipes that we were talking about. So uh, everywhere you see a colored line, that's a different type. And the different colors represent the different sizes of pipes. So these red, red lines here are six inch pipes, the blue lines are 12 inch pipes. And so you can see, you know, there's a variety of different size pipes. And a lot of that has to do with the way the system is built. The Water Authority has grown through acquisition. So a lot of the pieces that you see here were like puzzle pieces that were put together over the years. And as we put them together, we actually acquired these systems from, from private companies, from public companies. Most of the time, they were private companies. And most of these little water companies were looking to seize every nickel that they could out of their water system. So by the time they sold them to the Suffolk County Water Authority, they needed a lot of work. And so to this day, in most of our system, we're constantly replacing water mains to kind of bring it all up to uh, today's standards. So we, we, we spend a lot of time replacing water main. We, we spend about $20 million a year replacing aging water main. Um, and it's a very expensive proposition. And right now, actually, we're doing a big water main replacement job on Michigan. You may have heard about it or seen it. There's about a 4,000 foot replacement that's going on. And it's doing a couple of things. It's taking an old uh, six inch pipe, I believe, a six or eight, that's being replaced with a large, with a di uh, 12 inch diameter pipe. And it's going to do something also besides replacing the pipe, it's going to close a couple of gaps in the water system. And one of the things that we like to do is just like your arteries in your body, you want to have good flow for everything. So we don't like dead ends and we don't like gaps in the distribution system. So there are a couple of gaps on Station Road, and by bypassing Station Road, because that county road is a very expensive road to do work on, we're going into Michigan, replacing that pipe in parallel in Station Road, and closing a couple of gaps. So that's going to create better circulation of water. That's going to mean that people will receive better water quality in their areas. So it's actually going to help with water quality. A couple of the other things that we're going to do while we're here is we're going to close up some dead ends. And you may see here these red lines here, and there's a, a yellow line that connects the two. A dead end is a real it's a problematic thing in the water system. Sometimes it can't be avoided because roads are basically built as dead ends, right? It's all the fact that there is desirable place to live, right? Your kids can walk out on the street and not to worry about traffic. That's all good, but there's a water main that goes down that dead end and it can't go anywhere else because it's, it's landlocked there. So what we do in some cases here where they're actually after the, the street was put in, very often a cross street was put in, but the water main may have been put in 20 or 30 years before that. So we go back and we look for places, first of all, where we get complaints about water quality. Uh, and places where we know we're not getting the circulation where we get better fire protection because we also get better fire protection when we make these connections. More water 
is available out of a fire hydrant. Every fire hydrant gives out a certain amount of water. Some will give out 500 gallons a minute, some will give out 2,000 gallons a minute. And obviously, if you're fighting a fire, you want more water. So we make these connections, and we're doing these, actually, we have these planned in this area here, uh, and they're going to help improve water quality, and they're going to improve firefighting capacity. Uh, we have a couple of other projects. No, actually, you can go ahead. So uh, I think it was Chris that mentioned that we did install a DAC filter. So it's a station road uh, pump station, and that uh, pump station is north of Sunrise Highway on Station Road. You may notice the great tank that's there. Uh, there are wells right at that pump station. And one of those wells was impacted by uh, PFOA or PFOS, or both. Oh, both. Uh, uh, granular activated carbon does a really good job of removing those compounds. So we installed the DAC filter again back in March. Before that, we were blending, but it's much more preferable to have a filtration system in. So we put this system in, and it's been removing uh, PFOA and PFOS ever since. Uh, we also have a new well that we're going to be installing at the head of the neck well field, and that'll be going in over the winter here, and hopefully that'll be in service for the summer of next year. Uh, and again, I talked about this 4,000 feet of water main. Uh, that we're doing on Michigan Avenue right now. So the uh, the question that you asked about the uh, the manganese and you know these low levels and why would it affect water quality? So what happens with water quality? And, and Chris said that you know the iron and manganese levels in the wells here are relatively low, but they're perceptible. We see them in tests. Now what happens is over the years and over decades, when the wells are providing water to the people in our community, uh, the water flows through the pipes, right? And every night when we all go to sleep, we stop using water. And that water sits in the water main overnight with very little movement. On. And what happens is any metals that are in the water, and these are metals, right? And metal, as you know, is heavy. So what happens is overnight, the metals settle out in the water. Main. And maybe one night you would notice what settles out, but do that over and over again for a decade. And you get an accumulation of metals at the bottom of the water. And what happens occasionally is when uh, uh, the summer or the spring comes along and people start irrigating and using their sprinklers more often, or filling their pools or whatever you want to do, uh, the velocities of water in the water main pick up, and now that sediment that's at the bottom of the water main becomes liberated. And it starts to move, and people protect it in their home. And you start to see this all over. So it's very common for us to start to get rusty water complaints in the spring of the water. And it usually continues on through the summer because, as you know, as the summer moves along, people's lawns start to deteriorate, right? They start to die, and people use more and more water as the summer goes along to try to keep their lawns alive. And so the velocities pick up, and you get more um, uh, iron and magnets that's liberated. So, what do we do to address that? Uh, very often, if you fall, we'll tell you to just simply run your water, because very often it will clear up over just a, a short period of time. But the real way to address this is through what's called distribution system maintenance. And the Water Authority, over the past four or five years, has gotten very aggressive with doing more distribution system maintenance. Now we have 6,000 miles of water. And distribution system water maintenance, what that means is you flush the water main. So that means that you go to select fire hydrants throughout the system and you open them up and you let the water rush at a very, very high level. And that puts whatever sediment that's in the line out onto the street. Okay? And it's got to be very carefully done. It's got to be done area by area, by area. So it takes us years to get through our entire water system to do that flushing. But we just, uh, a type full of here runs our GIS group, and they just came up with a new mechanism for us actually recording the areas where we do flushing and keeping very close track of it. And this is a snapshot that I took this afternoon of one of our screens that shows the flushing that has been done recently over the summer in this area. And you see all these hydrants here that show kind of putting out water, those are all hydrants that we flushed. So we came in after we were on a, uh, a civic meeting with you folks that was back in May or June. Yeah. And right after that, because we heard complaints from you about water quality, we sent crews in here, we did a lot of flushing. We came back again in August and we did more flushing. 
And when we do flushing, we have the crews that do the flushing report back to us on what the water quality looks like when they flush, right? Because you want to know whether you're making an improvement. So the first time the crews came in, the report back was that there was rusty water, that they got a lot of rust out of the pipe. The second time they went in in August, the report back was that it was much, much better, that it was actually clear. That was the report that I got back. We're coming back again in October just to do one more this year, just to make sure that we got it. But I'm very comfortable that we've made a difference in the water quality. And I can tell because you're not getting rusty water. And I think I told you on the, uh, the, the meeting that we had, if anybody ever has a complaint or has an issue, you have to call. Because that's the only way that we know that you're experiencing the water. So I think that's it. Um, we'll take your questions afterwards. I'm going to let Ty come up with our. He's only a few more slides. He's not talking about all about ground. So I'm the uh, last speaker. I know you, know you have a lot of questions, and we're all looking forward to answering it. Uh, my name is Ty Fuller. I'm, I'm the lead hydrogeologist and the director of the mission at the Pacific Water Authority. Um, I play a lot of roles here, but what I really want to focus on is my role as a hydrogeologist. So in that capacity, um, I oversee the construction, design, maintenance of our network of 585 wells. I've been at the authority for uh, about 20 plus years. Um, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of different agencies, such as the Department of Health, you know, the Department of Investigation, United States Geologic Survey, uh, New York State CDC. Um, and, you know, from that role, you know, I've learned a lot about, you know, ground Selling a lot of myths. You know, I think one of the things that we're doing out is we hear a lot of stories. Like, for instance, there is no underground river coming from Connecticut to find a water right? Way back when. There is. Lake Ron Continent, there is no hidden plug that you can dig out to drain the water out. Right? I mean, these are things that, you know, we hear. And hopefully, you know, with what I'm going to talk about, I want to just tell a couple of myths. Uh, can you look up to the next slide? So, you know, we have a, a network, uh, like I said, about 585 active wells, approximately 600 plus wells. Um, they come in various uh, depths and sizes and things of that nature. We have some wells that are shallow, some wells that are deep. The wells that we uh, get um, come through groundwater, uh, they come through port spaces in between the sand and the gravel where we get the water from. So what I'm showing here is some illustrations of some of our wells. And uh, this right here um, is an example of a shallow well. Okay, um, we get our water from the aquifer. We have three different aquifers on Long Island. The shallowest is known as the upper glacial. About 20% of our wells come from the upper glacial. And as a matter of fact, Station Road, um, a nearby well that's easy, is a, a shallow glacial well. Well, there about 150 feet. Um, we have uh, the majority of our wells in the Magazine aquifer. That's the, uh, the middle aquifer. It's a little deeper. Um, head of the next road is like a good example of that. Um, and, and we have wells there. Um, the water quality there is a little bit different. And then the deeper aquifer is the Lloyd aquifer. Um, there's a, a moratorium in New York State that prevents the construction of wells there. Um, the idea is to preserve this water for future generations, what we consider some of the purest water uh, on Long Island. Now, Way back when, when I started my career here, you know, we used to look at wells and we said, well, where did that water come that feeds the well, right? And we used to just say, well, draw a circle around it. Because that, that's what you figure, right? You're pumping the well, you're lowering the pressure, the water's kind of coming nearby, right? We have a, a landfill nearby, right? And we just think that it's just sucking it down like a black hole. It's a little bit more complicated than that, right? Because water has particular rules. Like, for instance, water moves on average about a foot per day. It's not a bathtub, right? It doesn't just stand still. So depending on where you're at, that water has a particular flow path. That's one of the rules. We have uh, differences in elevation on the island, right? Along the spine of the island, um, the LIE, you notice it's like higher elevation, Ball Hill, Barmanville, both places. But as you come towards the, the, the coast, it's lower elevation. Groundwater moves in that direction. It follows that flow path. Even the geology. Right? Because um, depending on where you're at, if you're on the North Shore, Huntington, Tony Brook, you ever drive around and you notice you see like those big boulders? Like you'll see it it's on the road. You never see that on the South Shore. 
That's because glaciers built Long Island. The glaciers came from the North Shore. So when you're on the North Shore, in Huntington, those areas, you'll see those big boulders and stuff. It affects the water quality because those uh, glaciers, boulders, they go deeper than the South Shore. So they're more susceptible to surface attack. We have a lot of carbon, um, granular activated carbon on the North Shore. South Shore is different. South Shore, you're close to the ocean. Um, you have marine clays. Clays protect you from that water. So some of these deeper wells, the groundwater is older. It may be about 100 to 500 years. It's a little bit purer. But the problem that you have on the South Shore is iron. Because this water is deeper, it's older, it doesn't have oxygen, it's acidic, so you'll have naturally occurring metals that occur on the South Shore. So in this area, or along the South Shore, we have iron removal facilities. And as uh, uh, was pointed out earlier by, by Joe and Chris, that's an aesthetic thing. That's not like a health effect. People take iron supplements. But again, we don't want rusty water. So typically on the South Shore, you'll see those, those uh, particular issues. Now, the other thing with uh, uh, shallow wells is, um, you know, with uh, taking into account that, you know, water moves and, you know, uh, the closer a shallow well is, the closer you're drawing water. You know, you have to factor those things in. We've done a lot of research into that. Like, I'll give you another thing, right? Water moves on average, like I said, a foot per day. Every 10 feet that water moves vertically, it drops one foot. I'm sorry, every uh, 10 feet it moves horizontally, it drops one foot vertically. You understand that? Right, so it goes 10 feet, one foot drop, 10 feet, one foot drop. So you can see that if you have a shallow well, that contributing area is a lot closer. But now think about it. If you have a well that's 700 feet, that contributing area can be miles away. That's the difference. So in this example, you can see that this well here, the contributing area is a lot closer as opposed to the deeper well where that source water contributing area is miles away. That makes the world a difference. So sometimes you come to an area and you think, well, I got this, this well right here. I got a problem right here. Well, you know what? That contaminant could just pass right by that well. That's how that works. So let's jump to the next slide and let's talk about it. Um, now, what I'm showing here is a lot of different things. I want to take a little time to explain it. Now, uh, first things first, what I'm showing here is these blue lines. This is known as uh, lines of uh, contour. Now, this is uh, some work that I've done with the United States Geologic Survey. Every couple of years, they do an assessment. They'll measure the water level. Remember, like I said, water has different, you know, elevations depending on what you measure it. So, you know, as you go towards the, the center of the island, you have higher elevations. So basically, these numbers mean how much water you have above the level. For me, it tells me how much fresh water. The higher that number is, the more fresh water we have. Um, you see the numbers dropping? What that tells me is how groundwater moves. So water here is actually flowing from north to the south, and it's discharging. It's not like this, this random point where you're just pulling stuff in. Hit that button for me. This is the direction of groundwater flow in this area. And I want to orient you. See the landfill right here? This is the direction of groundwater flow. This is our well field. The groundwater is flowing to the southeast. Now, the other thing I'm showing here is these blobs. Um, this is known as uh, a source water assessment. Years ago, I want to say about 20 years ago, you know, we, we started to really focus in on the understanding that water comes from particular flow paths, like I pointed out. Like I said more than once, that water moves on average a per day. So when you kind of factor that in, the fact that you have water that flows in a particular way, geology, that changes depending on the uh, part of the island that you're at. <laughs> sure, I mean, I'm talking about something good right now, right? So anyway, um, look, you, you have all of these different factors. So years ago, you know, we said to ourselves, we need to get a better understanding. So about 20 years ago, we developed um, uh, what's known as uh, a county groundwater map. We work with the Department of Health, Public Water Investors, the Department of Public Works. And what that allowed us to do was to model the flow and movement of water. Now, that's a great framework that's used to this day. That increased our understanding of it. The other thing that we did, um, building upon that, that uh, groundwater model, was uh, the source water assessment program. We took every single well on Long Island, 1,300 wells, and we modeled them. And we wanted to see what the land use impact was. 
what areas of concerns that we had. And what that uh, factored in also was how long wells were being pumped. Taking all that information, now we can model specifically what the contributing areas are to a well. It's not a circle. It's following groundwater flow. So that well that we have at Station Road, that the nearest to that landfill, this is the area that is important to that well, away from the landfill. The groundwater is flowing to the southeast. So I've had questions. You know, we have a well field that's so close. Why is it not being impacted? We've looked at it. Now, here's the thing. There's some other factors. We showed you the chemistry of the water. Landfills, normally you'll see high levels of the metal, metal, cadmium, all these other things. We don't see those problems. PFOS that we can see, um, we see in other wells. And again, landfills could potentially be a source, but you have more uh, sources, such as fires, which have occurred in these areas. You get it from pizza boxes, no stick uh, coatings. You know, so there's, there's so many different things that, that play a role in that. But for us, and what I see, um, this uh, well is typical of what we see on the South Shore. Um, overall, the, the water quality is what I consider to be you know, high quality. Um, and, you know, again, from, from my uh, opinion, I don't see the impact coming from the land. Um, and, you know, again, you know, we, we look at that. Another thing I want to point out is, is that we have no wells down gradient from the land. Most of our wells exist outside of it. The residents that live in this area, by and large, are connected to public water. Are there people on private wells? Yes. Uh, we offer people the opportunity to connect to public water. Um, other people can speak on this. Um, that we have offered increased financing uh, to 25 years, depending on the area and the water quality impact. Yes. And you're talking about financing the connection to private public water. No, if for someone has a private well, which there are very few people in this area, they have the opportunity to connect to public water. Now, yeah. because there is a cost associated with that, what we tried to do, in addition to all the other things we talked about, was extend the financing so that it can become more affordable. But these people, they're, according to the Southern County Department of Health, there are 20 private wells within the Plume Study area. Who pays for it when those people go on to public water? It's not it's those people. It's not the town of Brooklyn who has a plume. And here you are with an arrow pointing right to where these wells are. Um, you know, they are not putting up the tap, as far as I know. Someone can correct me. Yeah. I'll, I'll be happy to answer those questions after the sure. presentation. Sure. Sure. So we'll, we'll address that, that question later on. But, you know, again, um, speaking specifically on our public supply wells, I hope I can illustrate, I illustrate that, again, the uh, potential contributing areas are outside of where the landfill is and what we see in our well fleet. Yes. Um, so I asked you for this map June, June 15th, something right. like that. Why, why wasn't I uh, provided that? This? Yeah. Because without this explanation, it would make no sense. Okay. And uh, can you provide the data behind this? Like, uh, if this is. This is based on your computer model. Correct. Um, so this is a hypothesis, right? In medicine, I'm a physician. In medicine, we always we model a lot of things. We trust and we verify, right? Okay, so, so I, Suffolk County Water Authority themselves was concerned about this enough so that in, uh, according to Dr. Tondes, in like 1992, you guys did studies because you were concerned with the impact of cell size on the construction of the um, This, uh, the, the Suffolk County groundwater model started in 1996 and was finished in 2002. I, I can't I, speak about I, I'm telling you the communications I have right. with Dr. Tondes, who said in 1992, which is almost 30 years right. ago, you guys were concerned about this, about the impact of the landfill. Obviously, now you're not concerned. Something happened in the last 30 years where you no longer have any concern about this, but you were concerned at one point, and you guys did pumping studies where you pumped at high levels to see if that was being impacted. Uh, does, is anyone aware of that? Well, I don't think anyone here knows who you're referencing and what you're I'm not familiar with you, do, you know who Dr. David Tondes is? I'm not, I'm not familiar. You pointed it out. I believe you sent an email, and then when I looked into it, I saw okay, that. Okay, he's a groundwater consultant from the town of Brooklyn. Right. And, and Normally, and when, I, when I do groundwater investigations, I consult the United States Geologic Survey, who are better equipped at things like that. If I don't connect, uh, contact them, I get in touch with the Suffolk County Department of Health. When you talk about a random researcher, again, I, I don't, I don't do that. Nor do I go on YouTube for random videos. And that's really demeaning. How are you yeah. talking? No, no, right? I apologize. I'm just saying that 
I'm consulting with the United States Geological. And I'm asking you for proof about right. this. I'm asking for your data for months. And you're, you know, this is supposed to be an agency. Well, well, hold on. You've interrupted five or six times. Go on. Let them answer this presentation and then we will answer any questions. Thank you. No, I'm looking forward to answering all your questions. So I don't, don't want to you know, take away, but let's, uh, let's just jump ahead a little bit so um, that we can get to the question. So um, we talked about a lot of different things, you know, and what we're trying to illustrate here is that we're very transparent with what we're trying to do. We're not trying to run away from the questions. We want to answer all the questions. Um, and, you know, as our, our, our lab, uh, Chris has shown earlier, um, we have our water quality information available on our website, fcwa.com. Go to our consumer conference report and address get that. Um, one of the projects that I was directly involved in was making sure that across Long Island, this water quality information is available to all of our residents. One of the problems we had many years ago was um, we have close to 50 different water suppliers on Long Island. We are the largest, but we are not the only one. And uh, historically, uh, water suppliers had issues uh, sharing this water quality information. There was no universal place where you could have that information. So uh, through an organization known as uh, LIFAP, Long Island Commission for Aquifer Protection, uh, we developed this program known as WaterTrack. And what WaterTrack allows you to do is by putting in your address, searching for a particular compound, you can see the state of groundwater, raw, untreated groundwater in the aquifer. You can go to our website, lifehaponline.com. You can look up uh, water quality data, see it based on the actual well. And you can actually see the difference between raw, untreated water and fresh drinking water. I'm drawing a comparison here because groundwater um, in its raw straight, uh, raw, raw state is not drinking water. When uh, water becomes drinking water, it goes through various testing. It goes through uh, testing that has to be uh, below the standards set by the federal government, the EPA, secondary standards set by the Department of Health. Additional standards set by Southern Water Authority. We take pride in delivering water what we consider to be of the highest quality. Can we jump to the next slide? So if you go to the website, lifehapponline.com, again, like I said, you can put in your address. You can search for a particular compound if you're interested in where PFOS or PFO is found, where iron is found, like I said, along the, uh, the south shore. You can see that. You can see the well, the level, when it was last tested. You can also compare it to uh, the drinking water, uh, treated drinking water, so you can see the difference there. I encourage you all to visit our website, lifecaponline.com, and learn more about it. Um, if you have any questions, you can always contact us. But you won't answer it. No, please. And with that said, um, we'd be happy to take questions. So let me start the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone else that you want to do Sure. Uh, I came around before uh, everyone, uh, before they started the presentation. This is my presentation. This is the Suffolk County Water Authority, Water Talk. Um, they invited me as a guest. I'm uh, Jason Heim. I'm the Chief of the Office of Water Resources for the Suffolk County Department of Health Services. Uh, I oversee a staff of around 30 different people. Uh, we oversee the drinking water supply in Suffolk County. So, uh, you know what they say, trust but verify. So, Suffolk County Water Authority uh, is one of about 200 different public water suppliers that we regulate here in Suffolk County. Uh, we oversee, inspect, and sample about a thousand public water supply wells every year, including uh, the 585 active wells that the water authority mentioned. So, we're out there every year uh, grabbing samples, inspecting their infrastructure, confirming that the water quality meets standards before it goes out to the consumer. So we submit those samples to our own Suffolk County Public Environmental Health Laboratory for analysis uh, to uh, verify that the water quality meets standards. We're also out there every other month in the distribution system, even in this area, uh, collecting samples to confirm the water quality you know, is comparable to what's entering the home in the same neighborhood. Uh, continues to meet drinking water standards as it moves through the distribution system. We uh, also have a private well sampling program. Uh, so we will sample people's private wells. I don't know if there's anybody here that has a private well, but we'll do that upon request for $100 fee. 
uh, or if you're going through a permitting process or operational of management, it may be slightly higher fees. If there's an area of potential contamination, uh, we've been working uh, since about 2016 with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York State Department of Health to initiate what's called private law surveys in certain areas. Uh, there's a couple of surveys going on in this area. If anybody has a title of here, uh, you may be uh, you know, in one of those private law survey areas. We've done uh, rounds of outreach to those areas, uh, door knocks, uh, where we come out to the home, we leave a notice, give the information about uh, what we're trying to do. We look to secure a sample, and that sampling is free of charge. We also mail a letter in those private law survey areas to the last known owner of record. Uh, and then we submit those samples for analysis to uh, either contact lab or our laboratory, depending on the analytics. So that's generally an overview of our program, uh, specifically focusing on the drinking water supply. And prior to this event, I wanted to look at what the water quality was in this area just to see, you know, over the last couple of years. So I looked at the last few years data that we have in our database. Uh, we had actually done, um, we had one complaint uh, in that time period. Uh, it was down in Delport, um, generally south of the Beaver Dam Road and east of Station Road. We went out and I looked just at some of the key tests. There was no maximum contaminant level violations for the parameters that we tested. Uh, the water quality, I think uh, some of the other members that presented here today talked about some of the key parameters that were related to, let's say, a landfill. Uh, so nitrates, fluoride, iron manganese, uh, there was no detection in nitrate or nitride. Uh, the fluoride levels were very, very low, six milligrams per liter, the standard 250 milligrams per liter. Uh, the iron at that home at that time was 0 0.15 milligrams per liter. Uh, the standard, as I said before, was 0 0.3 milligrams per liter, so it was half of the maximum contaminant level of the water standard in the U.S. state. And uh, the manganese was 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. We've also done several other distribution system samples, uh, located in uh, Camlet, uh, Fireplace Neck Road, Montauk Highway. We've done several samples there. No maximum contaminant level of species. Nitrates very low, chlorides low, iron manganese. Everything was compliant with drinking water standards. Uh, we also ran all organic compounds. Uh, the water quality is good there. It's just some low, very, very, very low levels of disinfection byproducts. Uh, I looked at the well fields in this area, headed the next road, uh, Station Road, the water authority presented. I went through uh, my data. Everything was compliant with the exception of the uh, iron, and the water authority was treating for that iron. They're injecting uh, a polyphosphate, which is like a sequestering agent, so it doesn't oxidize in the distribution system, and you're less prone to get that. The coloration of the tap and the porcelain stain and square. Uh, I just want to clarify that um, iron and manganese are both essential nutrients. Uh, we have learned in the last uh, couple of years from the health department that there are potential health effects for uh, if you can see very, very large amounts of iron uh, or if you have a specific. Um, medical condition called hemochromatosis. Uh, you can have things like stomach and intestinal issues that can cause things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, or stomach pain. But that is very high and, and much higher than those levels typically found in uh, drinking water, and definitely um, much, much higher than what we're seeing in this area. Before we get to questions, I also just want to recognize the uh, second county legislative file on Tara, who is among the county legislators in the area of the government. Is it still second county? No, no, it's just
for quick comments throughout the questions that you do so, but I want to let the residents ask. Um, thank you for doing this because it's important that um, feel confidence in the water that they're using. And um, we want to have all the questions answered. It will be something. You're welcome. Um, so, questions can you put? You may answer questions in group. You may answer questions in group. Um, I have a lot of questions. Yes, I'm Karim Odekan. I'm a primary care doc, but more importantly, I'm a community member, a father. Uh, I care about this community. I care about our drinks and water, as I'm sure you guys do. I also want to thank uh, Legislator Han for coming here. I think, I mean, uh, when I look at the other water talks that you guys have had, I'm always impressed by how council members come here. Um, I'd like to, you know, our legislator is not here. Our regional uh, district uh, one, like, no, council district four, council member is not here, despite my personal invitation, despite trying to have a conversation about these public health safety issues. Multiple times, Mr. Canale is here, who represents them. And I've asked Council Member Lombardio, he sees Mr. Uh, Canale. So I think it's just interesting that our elected officials will not have a conversation with their citizens, with their elected uh, uh, mm -hmm. constituents to talk about health and safety issues. It's painful. And I hope you take that back to Council Member Lombardio and let him know that this is unacceptable. Um, I will follow him, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have you had a previous commitment the last 10 times of asking that was public conversation? No. Okay. So uh, I just, you know, go, before we go into the Suffolk County Water Authority, I have a question for the Suffolk County Department of Health. Because I will say, while the Water Authority has been recalcitrant to give information that the public is requesting, the Suffolk County Department of Health has been extremely helpful in giving data. That said, um, you know, you just mentioned the review of the data for this area, but then I have data from the Suffolk County Department of Health on private well testing. After the um, contamination was found in the Brookhaven landfill plume of PFAS, and uh, that data shows that of the 20 private wells within the study area, and I brought them, you know, like this is uh, the landfill right here, and uh, this is the Department of Health's information on that hit, contaminant hit. Okay, so there's a real plume here. Let's not diminish it. Um, and and I'd also like to note that there's an uh, organic farm that irrigates right off the well, untreated, in the middle of it, too, which is an issue. Um, and of this, uh, so there are 20 private wells in. You know, this is the study area of the Subcontent Farmer Top. Okay. In 2017, contamination was found in the Brookhaven uh, landfill plume. Okay. Uh, people can argue about uh, whether this contamination was real or not, which, and Town of Brookhaven will argue. They don't think that this is real, um, which is very alarming because if you don't think it's real, then you would have retested it, right? Of course, since 2017, nobody has retested this. So we're having a conversation. Yeah. You don't. <laughs> I'm not even going to. So uh, I'm giving context. Okay, because, because you guys are not educating the public on the full context. I'm trying to give you the full You are. If you listen, you'll know. Your, your inability to listen is unbelievable. Sir, I'm speaking. Retaining my time. Uh, so, so, here we have in 2017 a plume, and the levels of contamination that we're talking about of PSOA. In the leachate, if you're not drinking, nobody's drinking this. I'm not suggesting we're drinking this. 2,300 parts per trillion, okay? Into the, uh, into the, the balloon. We look at up, so how do we know that it's affecting the groundwater, right? You have up gradient wells and down gradient wells. The level of P4 in the down gradient well is three to nine times higher than the up gradient well, depending on where we're talking, where we're talking about, okay? Can I look even again? Has our head in the sand on it. Um, so, if that's, so this is obviously a health concern, okay? So knowing that, the Department of Health and DEC surveyed uh, the remaining private wells. There's 20 of them. Only one-third responded to you. 
right? Two thirds did not respond. Of the one third that uh, that responded to, forty percent of them had landfill contaminants, right? Two had too fast above drinking level standard. They are still to this day only one of them is connected to public water, right? Yes. What, 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 so, so. I don't think so. No, I'm that. So, in the four years that we knew that there was a PFAS plume, it seems like the, that the fact that we've only tested one third of the private wells, and only one of them, three of them have been contaminated, one of them has been hooked up to public water, that seems too slow. That seems like inaction to me. Okay, if we're talking about public health concerns. So I want to know what's, you know, what is the cause of the delay in investigating the plume in, uh, in the plume study area from the public health perspective? So I don't oversee the groundwater plume or whatever's coming off of the landfill that's in the state department of environmental conservation. What we're doing is uh, conducting the private well survey because that's uh, my main focus try to protect what we call the receptors. So all those private wells that are hydraulically down the radiant, uh, as Ty showed on the map, you know, our hydrogeologists that I work with assess the groundwater flow in the area and they came up with the box that you have uh, blown up on that map. I uh, thank you for providing that. I have a smaller copy, but that's much nicer. And we identified working with Suffolk County Water Authority, everybody that was not connected to public water at the time. So they helped us identify those uh, 20 potential private wells. We did the outreach, as you say, in 2017. Uh, I can't force someone, I can't force my way in, my sanitarians that work with me, can't force their way in to secure a drinking water sample from someone's home. It's a voluntary program. It's a free testing program that we offer as a service to the community. We certainly encourage everyone to participate and take advantage of it for the protection of public health. Are you suggesting that people decline? Yes. Uh, the information that you gave me said nobody declined. Well, declining means decline to answer, to respond. So, so the kind of respond is different. It's like whether they got the letter, whether there's a tenant in there, whether they answered the door, that's a different question. Yep. It's a function of how much you went after them. Right. So, you know, we did that outreach in September 2017. We did get a low response. You know, it's, uh, we've done, I think, over 44 different private well surveys all throughout Suffolk County, uh, specifically looking at the plural of the substances. And, um, you yeah, know, this was one of the very, very early ones uh, was conducted in that area of uh, the state of Atlanta. And so who pays when these people get hooked up to public water? So what happens is if we find contamination, specifically the PFOX control over a drinking water standard, uh, we notify the Department of Environmental Conservation and the U.S. Department of Health. They do an evaluation and look at it in, in regard to their policy, and they determine whether they're going to, uh, they'll typically, and what I've seen is they're providing an alternative water source that bottled water as a short-term solution, and then they're working on a longer-term solution. If there's a public water main available, what I've seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've seen them make offers and coordinate with Suffolk County Water Authority to connect those residents to public water, as you saw in that one case. Otherwise, they're providing what they call a poet system, a point of entry treatment system. At the time that we did this private well survey, uh, the only level that we had to really benchmark the results to was the federal health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion combined to fast and to solve. So that was the trigger to provide some sort of a mitigating measure, like bottled water or a pollen or a public water. Okay. I'm sorry, for the That's the uh, New York City Environmental Conservation Program. Uh, so 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 In that case, that I just mentioned where we detected contamination over a, a health benchmark. The New York State has been paying for uh, that was if it was over 70 parts per trillion. That drink of our time. standard is now 10 parts per trillion. So if you were at 30 parts per trillion, you would have been. Correct? At that time, yeah. the resident yeah. probably would have gone out on the own at our recommendation. 
uh, to provide treatment if they so chose. If this landfill generated half a billion dollars in the last 10 years, okay, if I, I, you would definitely get more participation, if this is low participation, if you made it clear to people that if they find contaminants in their private wells, that this would be connected to public water facilities.
But so we have any point, we all get together and we look at all these further years that we're working on. And then it becomes more serious, it becomes that the house is up. And then we brainstorm and say, we start to make a fun because our war is a good what is, what, what is, uh, how, how much is going to cost to provide a couple of thoughts in that? So we do this on a monthly basis. We go around and try to do all the time. Um, with respect to the standards, so, you know, standards change as technology. We talk to the first of all, first of all, we talk about how we start to be and then we start to be coding and how we start to be coding. We're talking about, you know, second, even the very few thousand years. I can see that. Very, 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 very low levels of contamination. And so you have a way of the life. And you have to say, I can see the very few thousand years. So that's what we're talking about. We talk about the low levels of contamination. Tell me what you do. So because technology allows the regulators so we can actually measure that. We can't measure it here on the regular level. We can't regulate it. So that's just a practical reality of how to take more regulations and to keep all. So if technology gets better, if there's more things get better, and what happened in the United States is because of various determination of that throughout the state, we start to see up a way, see up a way. The New York State Legislature adopted a law to see the existing water quality council. And they empowered the county to meet on a regular basis throughout the state and come up with a proposal for standards for emergency contaminants, so CFOA, CFOA, one for the last year. And they, they met over the last few years and they eventually recommended uh, new drinking water regulations. The FOA, the FOS, and that's what they're asking. Ten parts per trillion for the FOA, ten parts per trillion for the FOA, and one part per trillion for one for the FOA. Now, when they adopt those standards, I think they're going to be the only standards for the only state in the entire country. And so, the water quality council meetings, those are the things that they need to do then to all the water. So I find it just amazing that we can always talk about these are seconds and years and things like that, but not once in this hour and a half. Does anyone talk about the health consequences of these that chemicals? I was actually going to over to me. I was going to pick that up. Okay. So thank you uh, for not letting or, me get away with it. Or, 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 to answer that, my question is um, um, the answer that I need. Mean, yeah. Where is the, what we're talking about here is mainly the, uh, what we do after the contamination has already entered. When do we talk about the contamination not being present? Our cells are actually built, you know, 
you made a joke that you're never going to find that. But you have to understand. That's why I was trying to put the perspective of, of my event to you know, part of the team. Okay, so let me just give you one more example of this. Okay, you, you test your pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Okay, you test for caffeine, you test for ibuprofen. We had a few dogs that have a couple of hits of ibuprofen. Okay, if you drank a few liters of water every single day, a dog would do. Okay, for the rest of your life, you're not going to get one single dose of that. I you put your the IOT like a key back. No, but I'm just telling you that if you were going to CVS and buy your 250 milligram Tylenol, you're not going to get one single dose. Trivialized. No, no, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you. And I'm being honest. In terms of are you going to the bio team or keep that stuff? That's why we have parts for children and this is like if I have to find what I want. And what we're doing is that so when they continue. So we just water every single day, right? Because we are exposed to them at a lot of different points. It's not just the water being drink and that's the And now everybody's water is supposed to have people. And, and so mm -hmm. then an aspect of why it's so low, we can just be clear. It's not just because that technology has changed. This is what you guys have said a few times. It's also because we are increasingly aware as, as, as um, a society that, you know, we are being exposed to these in our food, in the pizza boxes, in our soap, and these are toxic things that stay with us forever. So it is, we have to be concerned about 10 parts per, per trillion. And if it, and if it becomes five, we have to be concerned about that because this really has an impact on folks' real life and health issues. So we should just know that we are not only exposed to this in our things that we drink, we're exposed to it everywhere, which is why we have such a high standard. So, like I said, most of the stuff has only popcorn bags. Like those popcorn, that has a little piece of things, you get like a piece of this recording that has it. They okay. can't dental floss. Like the amount of products that it has, and I'm not familiar with the water, but I think what I've learned from this is, is that the amount of times we change environmentally, but that's a problem. That, that is a big thing. But that's why we have to be so careful about the water. Yeah. Because other things we cannot always control. Absolutely. And also it is these agencies that actually right. they set the standard for yeah. other industries as well. And, and so point. that's why we have to be on this issue all the time. And actually, not say it's just because the text has changed and that it's one second in years. Yeah. That is not really the right message to offer us because we are trying to set the right perspective. Okay, good. It's not a relevant topic. It is. And I think it's, it's difficult to talk. So the yeah. Okay. That, that's all and, and I want to get perspective. You're sitting in the community with the lowest life expectancy in all of Long Island. Three million people. Okay. We have, according to the CDC, this is the perspective we have. We have a couple of again, so I know what's behind, gentlemen. And and just like, I just want to make sure that you felt like your question was completely answered because. Well, I just it was uh, as Adam was just saying as far as. In other, um, in other products and stuff like that. Um, we start to be our champion. Yeah. So if you are having a problem because maybe we're getting pushback, because we're asking some questions, or maybe because your technology has a fucked up or whatever, um, you have to push that against the reasons why we have this stuff in our world. So then mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we talk to you about it, but you also have an agency, a body, a, a, a authority that can champion these things for us so that as we struggle with our everyday lives, two or three jobs, or whatever the heck yeah. we're going through, that we have somebody that's championing this thing with us and that we're not out here by ourselves. Well, mm -hmm. I appreciate that very much. I think we can get into the we talk to you. We talk to you.
Ja, we hebben ons hier een keer. Het is altijd wel lastig te krijgen. Toen we de file zien. Het wordt wel. Het wordt in de security. Mark 2018. Het is wel lastig. Ja, dat is een several year process. En het wordt very closely with our office. Het wordt een hele problem. Because this new treatment technology, that they may have been using in Europe and other areas, we didn't know if it was going to create something that was even worse than what they were trying to remove. So it was a very long and probably very expensive, I, I didn't look at the numbers, but probably a very expensive process to, to get the regulatory approval to ensure, I mean, we need to get regulators to ensure, I mean, we need to see, we drink this water too, to make sure they're not creating the data issue that they were trying to solve. <laughs>
And the other, the other problem is we have Ed or me, we are simple. We still knock on the door. They won't give us an address. Ed or me in August said that there are no private wells within the plume. In Boys and Girls in August, they okay, are our town supervisors. So obviously, there's not coordination happening at the highest levels of government about well, there's our assessment area, yeah. and we may have been a little bit more conservative than where you know the, the town working with the DEP and the consultants uh, defined a, a plume. So we may be a little bit more conservative than that. So the private well could yeah. potentially be in our assessment area, but outside of the plume, I, I, I haven't looked specifically at that. Um, I will say that we did do the door knock. We did go door to door, and we don't share the specific. Uh, private well locations because we don't want those people to be harassed or, you know, someone committing try to sell them filtration systems. You know, we don't, we don't want to harass these people. Uh, you know, there are residents who try to offer a free service to them. Uh, you know, we don't specifically regulate them. Uh, it, it's up to them. Maybe they went out and uh, they got a test on their own and they took action on their own. That's, that's fully within their American right. Uh, so I wonder, and so maybe it's extra outreach ahead where you can say on this block there's a well and we're going to, um, you know, we're going to alert the block that is coming. You know, like there, there might be something we can do that doesn't give out the personal, but that, that helps to be, um, notify the homeowner. Um, Something that we can do better. 
I would say that the town is a town has to talk about the food, right? This, this is not something you can find on your website. Uh, we talk about the book we have to I took six months of aggressive spoiling to get this information from the Department of Health, Suffolk County, New York State, CDC, EC, only they had no private law sector. This is not public knowledge. As you talk about the landscape, this is a 300 foot monument to environmental injustice hiding in plain sight. Okay? And, you know, the plume is a part of that. that we, this is, you know, 2 million people garbage here, and nobody talks about it. There's no, you know, the liner has been ripped for 40 years. Uh, nobody talks about this. There, you cannot go to any agency. CEC has no information on the landfill plume on their website. They'll talk about air quality, this and that. Nobody wants to talk about this. I'm sorry, this is it's not fair to this gentleman. Sorry. Uh, let's go to Hans. Okay. okay. I know you had your hand up the next thing. Well, uh, so I had two questions. Um, you talked about how many questions you from I did not The 
it's fine. I have a few questions. Um, if you could uh, flip back the slides yeah. um, into uh, the introduction, I just add the opposite. This one. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, I was interested in this map, uh, in this graph. Um, I'm not an expert at all. Can you talk about the concept of a sole source aquifer? Because that was a word which was not mentioned as we talked about all of these three things. And then I have a few other questions after that. But that how does that idea of um, a sole source aquifer fit into what you are offering? Mm -hmm. So again, um, it is considered one aquifer, right. but uh, going to that little further, there are multiple levels of that. Is that accurate? Like, I was age three. I'm not familiar with that. 
I didn't grow up there, unfortunately. Wow! Is there anyone here that knows no, this history? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you're working with the Department of Environmental Conservation and yep. evaluating all those financial plans. Great. Yeah. But, but actually, this is an important thing that I would urge you all to actually investigate. Because I've been trying to piece together the story and how I've been able to actually understand it is that because of uh, activism, ideas, research about the source source Africa that led to this LI Lanza Law 83, which gave about six plus years after that point to close down most of the land of the land. And this is important because you guys deal with the water and have done an excellent job as far as I can tell. So it is important that um, this history is significant because there was one landfill which was not closed with the LI landfill law, which was the Brooklyn landfill. In fact, it was a standard. That the thing which occurred was that it led to uh, uh, a new structure in which our um, the household waste became burned and turned into ash and was brought right back to the same site which had underneath it the raw waste, the fuel oil, all of that stuff was there, and now we have ash being put on top of it. Along with CND. Are you guys aware of any of this history? Not really. Okay, 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 okay. I'm asking all of these things because the thing that I've been trying to understand as I've been listening is why are you not concerned about the Brookhaven landfill impact on our groundwater? I definitely appreciate all of the work. You all have done in terms of plastics, in terms of other things. But it's very odd to me that there is a landfill <laughs> just over there which has a plume. When that um, plume is tested, it has sky high levels of every because of everything that I've just described. It's an old landfill, on, and then we have toxic ash on top, and then we have CMD on top. This is a risk to our groundwater. And I, and I am not an expert, so I have to trust this claim about the fact that our station road well is not, um, is, is not being fed from this Landfill, that's fine. But the landfill is impacting our groundwater because there are other wells which are down it, which are being tested and have sky high levels of everything because we have a landfill. Why are you not concerned about it? You are concerned about plastic, you're concerned about this or that. Why? Why is that? I'm certainly yeah. concerned with the outcome, and that's why this is one of the very first federal surveys that we're making. So we historically done federal surveys in that area before we before we were being developed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, we've done a number of federal surveys in the area. I'm certainly concerned about that. Our office of uh, ecology has heard you see them sampling in that area. There was, uh, I think there's a community got together and they had uh, a feeder dam to task force. And from what our office of ecology tells me, uh, they initiated some surface water sampling down gradient in some of those creeks and streams uh, in response to some concerns that were brought out by that test force. Right. And that monitoring continues, and they, that's where exactly that's where the bullseye map yes. came from, was from uh, the report that was produced and they by it. to the back, so right? To the back department. Yeah. And, and that monitoring continues, they told me. I checked with them before I came back because I seemed to get a question about it. Sure. They told me that that monitoring continues and that data is available online. 
Now he's going to convert. So you get nothing from the town. And, you know, it's not your jurisdiction. And, you know, so his pastor was like, he tells us to talk to you. Uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah, but you know this is a round robin that was tired for one year. On. At least it's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. And so I, why did they tell you to come and speak to the second time? Because they want to pass the bus, so, so and it keeps getting passed. Let's have a meeting. Okay, this is my solution to this. Okay, Suffolk County Water, or Suffolk County Department of Health, New York State Department of Health, Town of Brooklyn. Uh, uh, we um, you know, have this happened in Bloomfield just last week in upstate New York. There was, with the same issue, he passed in the ground bar. But who was there? Many different agencies. And I appreciate some kind of yeah. Yeah. I appreciate some kind of yeah. uh, But there, obviously, we need to get everybody in the same room. This is a great room to have that conversation, I think, because it's big, it's an, an impacted community. And uh, we need to have a public conversation, the county, the town, everybody, because everybody is passing the box. Uh, and this has been going on for too long. And can I, you got it? Oh, oh, oh. I, you know, I, I didn't know what Katie's done. Oh, basically, I just wanted to say something about, I know you were talking about the iron and everything in the water. Okay. And I have spoken uh, uh, via um, messenger to Suffolk County Water Authority, the smell, is there in my water. And I know you say tested. I had my water tested. The gentleman that came and tested it, the smell is just horrible. It smells like chlorine. I wouldn't drink the water. And I would invite any one of you guys to my house to take a sip of the water. It, it's horrible. Is, that, is it chlorine that's horrible? Chlorine, uh, uh, it, 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 just, it smells bad. And I know if, if you wouldn't drink it. I'll just say that. I think I always Yes. I think. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's walking distance yeah, away from okay, here, okay. and 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 the smell is horrible. Like right. you know, this this coloration yeah. is on and off. You know, it hasn't been. Is it better than? Yeah, but the smell is it's still there. Yeah. It's still there. And well, sometimes the chlorine though. I'm saying chlorine. I don't know, but I'm just I just don't know. Yeah. I, I invite anyone you guys to come to the house and and no, no, drink I, that water. I, I, I wouldn't. We don't. Yeah. Just on the biggest complaint that we get. Back to the um, source area, please. Yeah. Yep. So, six, you know, two and a half months ago, Mr. Fuller and I talked about, you know, what is the source area contributing to the landfill, uh, contributing to the. Um, I'll tell you that is. You send me this map. Uh, so this is the map that you sent me showing the Suffolk County well and its proximity to the station of the well. This is the map that I got from you. All right. So, and, and as a follow up, I asked you for uh, this, this map. Well, it's interesting because I also posted on the Suffolk County Authority um, Library Facebook page recently as like unanswered questions from Suffolk County, and it was removed, selectively removed, which is 
And you said, Mr. Sabda, that that was because it was factually incorrect. And I'd like you to tell me in my face, what was factually incorrect about what was you said it's either repetitive or fast and correct. So, so how many times did I ask that question? Okay, so you don't you didn't like the question, so you deleted it. But now I'm asking. So it's okay, it's okay. So look, here this is Horizon Valley right here. Okay, this this map shows that the source water area for this well doesn't cause Horizon Valley. Suffolk County Department of Health. Uh, Suffolk County, um, the Suffolk County had a, a GIS for this um, 265 acres that they ended up selling, which is now the plan to be the Winter, uh, Winter Brothers Transfer Station in Yapan. And as part of that uh, environmental impact statement, they had to show uh, the source water for the well full, um, the source water area for the well. So in this, the Basically, the this similar map, okay, but this one this one crosses uh, Horizon Village, which is basically a thousand feet away from the landfill. Okay, I'm making this to say that these are projections. Okay, these are models based on the best science that the federal government has worked with. You. I think that's fine. I'm glad that you guys are looking at it that way. But I don't need projections. Okay, this is the well map. Surrounding the landfill, there are multiple water uh, monitoring wells at the uh, at the border of the landfill, a stone's throw away from the source water area. Okay, why are we guessing? Let's check. If, and if these water uh, uh, monitoring wells are not deep enough, let's build new ones. But like in Smithtown, it would be unacceptable to have uh, source water for a public well one thousand feet away from a landfill for two million people. Why is it acceptable here without any monitoring? We don't have to guess about, you know, is the landfill plume contributing to it? We can check. Uh, and this is basically either it's too expensive for you guys for modern wealth. I, I understand what you're saying. It all sounds very outrageous. What's the system of water quality? So we are trying to testing the water every five years. We're testing the water. So the proof is in the water quality. And you found this out to contaminate it. And everybody here pays eighty dollars a year to pay for your the gas treatment facility. Okay. okay, so this is you know the proof is in my only, is in my water bill. It's not the only well that has a, a, I, I uh, understand, but it is the only well next to the landfill for two million people. Yeah, but there's no there's no well directly to the landfill. So you're saying that it's not in your interest to test. We test all the time. Constantly. You're not testing the modern well. You tested, you found contamination. But, but Mr. Zabda is saying that you guys coordinated the highest levels of government to make sure that our groundwater is safe. This is testing the model. They are not. I have four of them. They are not. They have, nobody has tested PFAS in those mining wells since they found PFAS in the in 2017. And you should know that. You point out many people are positive. And just going back to the emails, you have to want to do with me. No, I'm asking you to coordinate. He said at the very beginning, we went to Suffolk County Water Authority. We're not Suffolk County government. I mean, if you, guys, if you guys don't want to protect the well, that's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll, pay, we'll pay to clean it up. We're an hour later than we were supposed to be here. So can you just wrap it up? I'm trying to get a straight answer. So you guys have no interest in checking the modern well. It's not that we don't. It's that, that it's, this is a state resource. Groundwater, water on, on the New York is a state resource. It's overseen by the DEC. When we construct a well, we have to get a permit. From the DEC. Now, unfortunately, although we are all here, I can't speak on behalf of the DEC. How about the Department of Health? Uh, is this an issue for the Department of Health that because you know that in 2017 there was PFAS in the plume, something like uh, at the levels of uh, at the PFAS are reaching, you know, at the level of thousands in the parts of the trillion, and that it's found in multiples at the downgrading levels and the upgrading levels, there's PFAS in the plume, okay? There's PFAS in the public well. Adjacent to the landfill, this, you know, depending on who you ask, the source area is a stone's throw away from the landfill. And the downgrading has three to nine times the levels of the upgrade. According to the DEC, the landfill is contributing to the to the. Okay. What do you? What's your point with respect to this? The point is, we water. Okay, okay. But, but Mr. Zabdo is saying he's coordinating with the highest levels of government. Nobody's coordinating. 
we know the coordinates every single well that there may be a monitor protocol for. We coordinate with the health department and the public water department. We coordinate with the DEC with regard to contamination uh, And why do we coordinate them? Because we don't want to impact them all well, right? So that's why we coordinate them. The most important thing we do is we test that well specifically so we know exactly what's in it. And that's what was presented earlier. And we found feedback. And these public paid $80 a year out of their water bill for clean water. And more downgrading. And more downgrading, right? Suggesting the landfill is contributing to the feedback system. Well, let's check it. Right, let's follow that logic a little bit further. If you, if, 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 if we didn't check it, there's the six logic, modern ones. But the logic, me, the logic is, it is just a lot of places all over Long Island. It's unfortunate, but it's there. And we checked in our well to make sure it's below drinking water. Safety. And it wasn't. You know, it was it was 64 parts per trillion, which is above the 10 parts per trillion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the, the regulation was August of. Yeah. 